the talk as well as I usually do. Now, where's my... There it is. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a bit of an extemporising talk because I've done... Um, I mean, this is you know, un un unplanned, so I'm going through another presentation in a slightly clunky order. I'll move around a fair bit. But I want to start with, with first of all, the question of, of the value theory in economics and where should economics start from. And uh, you know what I mean by value theory? Okay, neoclassical or utility maximising theory of value. Marxists have a labour theory of value. Post-Keynesians had no theory of value. And the reason was they saw the the mess going on between the neoclassicals at one extreme and the Marxists at the other. And effectively, most of them think it's a totally futile exercise to even talk about value theory. They simply presume that output's produced and then we have the, the social and social and, and physical uh, processes involved in both you know, producing it, distributing it and so on. And so there's been no real value theory in post-Keynesian economics. And there's, you may see one paper, a couple of papers I'd recommend taking a look at to get a feeling for that. There's one by Jeff Harcourt, and uh, I think it's Harcourt and Hamuda, and it's called Horses for Courses. And that argues basically that they're, you know, we, we're going to be uh, agnostic about methodology. We're just going to use whatever methodology works in a particular area, and that's it. And there was a reply by, uh, I think it's Roger Backhouse, um, who is a, he's a sort of progressive neoclassical in that sense. Sorry, Roger, if you feel I've insulted you, but, you know, he's pretty neoclassical but able to communicate with other schools and has a range of approaches as well and interested in methodology. And his comment back on that was, well, if, if it's horses for courses, why will you never mount a neoclassical horse? Okay, because at the same time as saying any method goes for our positive work, post Keynesians have spent their time attacking neoclassical economics. So how does that go together? It's horses for courses, why... Never a neoclassical horse. Um, and I have sympathies for, for literally the latter view, that there's, you can't just say, well, we're going to use any old methodology at all and forget about um, questions of where does profit come from, which where does surplus come from, uh, what is the objective of, a, of a, what is the purpose of capitalism, if you like, forget about that and still modelling it. Um, but I can understand the frustration because I'm also a critic of the labour theory of value. Well, the very first thing I did as an academic, or as, as a, I was actually still doing my master's degree at that stage, I wrote a critique of the labour theory of value. And to relate to your question earlier, Thomas, about where did the... Did you ask, or who did ask, about where did the interest in energy come from? Okay, sorry, Daniel. Um, I, rem I got into reading Marx because in the 1970s, um, the economics department at Sydney University, in the 1960s, it was a very progressive humanist-oriented department, so people who are uh, old-style Keynesians that actually read Keynes, unlike the new-style ones who, you know, they read a summary by Samuelson and think they've read Keynes. Uh, so they were genuine humanists, uh, very progressive people, and the vice-chancellor at uh, Sydney University at the time was an economist, Bruce Williams. Um, he wasn't appointed as an economist, but he thought the economics department was too wishy-washy. So he appointed two very neoclassical economists to take over the department in the absence of the acting head. And they basically threw out an old progressive curriculum and brought in a strongly neoclassical, you know, mathematically oriented, learn your optimization techniques, teach them Lagrangians, that sort of thing. Uh, and the staff led a revolt, some of the staff. Uh, that had all settled down by the time I arrived to some extent, but it was a very unhappy place. This is 1971 when I turned up as an undergraduate student. And... Um, I swallowed the neoclassical theory at the time. Back when, when I did my university degree, this is a bit of a comment on the, st the quality of universities over time, the textbooks I used in my high school were more advanced than the text I, I see uh, students using in second and third year these days. So my textbooks, I'd already I'd covered in difference curves, uh, you know, deriving a demand curve, uh, Harrod's theory of growth, the hicks hansen uh, trade cycle model. I'd done those at school. And what I expected when I got to university was that I was a bit bored with all the supply and demand stuff. I thought I, I, I believe the analysis, but I thought I'll go on to doing this in, in dynamic terms, on the differential equations, which I was also learning at school and learning at university. There was none of that, but I still swallowed the theory. Anyway, um, in the middle of first year, we had a new lecturer, Frank Stilwell, who was a young, like he was 28 or so at the time, I think, very, very young, newly appointed PhD. He was given the first year class. And Frank explained the theory of the second best to us. Have you heard of that at all? Okay, you have. Okay. When, did you, when did you first learn about it? 
in debunking economics or in a course somewhere? Second year of my Pardon? When I was second year student, I guess. Which, which I, I can't hear properly. Uh, in my undergraduate program. Undergraduate, okay, which year? Second year. That's not bad because normally they only learn that stuff in honours years. And the thing, by the time you learn it in honours years, if you've got as far as an honours course, you treat it as a wrinkle in the theory, you know. Interesting little wrinkle to be explored maybe or forgotten. Uh, where you get it in first year, my reaction was, holy shit, here's, here's a theory that says that the, the best situation, for example, for the labour market is to have competitive employers facing competitive un uh, workers, no trade unions, no, in no monopoly. But you show if you start at that position and you abolish one or the other, you necessarily make welfare worse. And I think that's what my personal reaction was. This is this is crazy because how can you go from a theory which at one level tells you, you know, that a particular action is the best idea, and taking in one element element of reality, the existence of effectively monopoly buyers of labour and monopoly sellers of labour, and suddenly tells you making taking one step but not two towards that perfect point will make things worse. Now, there's got to be something wrong with the theory. So I started reading uh, the. I gave up on the textbooks and started reading journal papers at the time. And then I began to become a huge critic of the mainstream. At the same time, Australia was involved in the Vietnam War. This is a very long personal digression, by the way, involved in the Vietnam War. And I was also, Australia was, had conscription. So you could be conscripted to go and fight in Vietnam. Now, it seemed rather, I was actually in favour of the war as a, as a high school student because I believed in the whole anti-communist thing. Uh, except I still remember the stupidity of being given leaflets as I got off the train at my parents' uh, suburb in Hurstville about this yellow peril coming down from the north, which seemed ridiculous to me, like there was gravity that was going to cause them to flow down from, uh, you know, from, from China to, uh, to Australia. I still remember getting that shoved in my hand by a couple of young right-wing uh, students at, at, uh, at my school. Uh, but I thought it rather strange that I was going to be cons conscripted and compelled to fight for freedom. So I started researching Vietnam as well, and I finally realised that uh, A, I, I was not a conscientious objector, I would fight, but B, this was a colonial, this was an anti-colonial war, and I was going to fight in anybody, decided to be the Viet Cong. So I was becoming a draft resistor in that sense as well. Um, I didn't need to become one because in 1972, the very end of 72, uh, the Labour Party, which had been out of power for 23 years in Australia, won the election, and its very first act was to pull out of Vietnam. But I had my bags packed in case they didn't, so I'd go off and join the Draft Resistors Union that night at Sydney University. Didn't have to do it. Anyway, that's, you mentioned the amount of energy involved. You're deciding whether you're going to be a conscientious objector, a uh, draft resistor, and I was, there were thousands of students in that situation. And we were all heavily engaged in universities, we weren't paying any fees, most of us, okay, so there was no need to do part-time work virtually living on campus, it's an incredible level of political and dis discussion and philosophical discussion and so on. And all of a sudden the Vietnam War was just removed. You had this energy in all these people. And it was fully it was full employment. Total the un unemployment rate in Australia in nineteen seventy two I think was one percent one and a half percent. That was a recorded rate of unemployment. So you had no fear about not getting a job. And uh, we all dived into um, any resistance we had about what we were being taught. And a student revolt began in the architecture department of all places at Sydney University in 19, late 1972. And then it spilled over into the philosophy department because the two uh, female philosophers put on, proposed a course on philosophical aspects of feminist thought, which the department supported. And the, the professor, who was conservative, rejected. But they had a democratically run department at the time, so it was put through. He then appealed to the next level at the university to block it. And then the next, the, the, the staff themselves appealed to the level above that. So he went from faculty to um, a Senate. And the Senate approved it, and then the Vice Chancellor blocked it. So the staff came along and asked all the departments to go on strike to support philosophy. And at the same time, I'd been trying to organise a conference on radical economics and other stuff like this. And um, the staff approached me to try to lead a rebellion of the economic students. And by this stage, I'd given up on them. And I said, look, you know, they're a bunch of you know, apathetic wankers. They won't do anything. And uh, the guy that asked me, Gavin Butler, then said to me, Frank's class, which is the first year class, has voted to go on strike. We just, I ran out of the building, started getting friends together. We had a meeting we called 
uh, I think on the 18th of July, 1973, and we were 450 students in the room talking about what this is why I've got so much identification what you guys have done with YSI okay I've, I've, I've done the same thing a long time ago and um, we had a meeting and myself and a guy called Richard Fields were the two main personalities calling the meeting and going and trying to work out what to do but we really didn't have an idea what to do next and a guy none of us knew called Richard Osborne popped up in the middle of the room and said I think we should have a day of protest that sounded like a fantastic idea. So he came down, and of the class, of the room, about 450 people, about 10% came down so they helped organise it. So this huge outpouring. One week later, we had a day of protest at the University of Sydney, and we had we, we all went on strike. The staff, half the staff joined us, and um, we then managed to bargain our way through with support of the dean to finally get a Department of Political Economy established at Sydney University. So that's that's my background of that. So that's why I've got such an identification with YSI people. I don't think the department's gone particularly well. It's 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 eschewed mathematical analysis, as though maths is the enemy. And I think you all know that's not my attitude. I, I taught what neoclassicals do, not mathematics, but mythematics. And I don't know who told me this, but I was I've forgotten, unfortunately. But somebody, when I mentioned my little quip, he said his uh, in his term for econometrics was econometrics. I think those two pretty cool little ways to describe how much economists abuse what is supposed to be mathematical method. So that's the background of that stage. At the end of the year, we then had a, uh, a Marx reading group. Because I have read you know, a lot of stuff. We're going to do the usual story, getting a group to read Capital together. And I remember walking through uh, Sydney University's campus with one of my colleagues, and we were discussing the labour theory of value, which we hadn't actually read at the time. And I... Th we looked on the horizon, and around the horizon there were dozens of those cranes. You know the, the big cranes are used on construction sites? They're actually called kangaroo cranes, I think, because they're either designed in Australia and there's something about their leverage that involves like a kangaroo's bounce capability. And um, I said, I really have a hard time believing those things don't add value, which was Marx's argument. Labor's the source of all value. So we had a capital reading group, and I read capital and I found this brilliant argument in Marx about use value versus exchange value. So rather than neoclassical saying utility, uh, marginal utility is equated to marginal cost, and you've got an equality between utility and cost. Marx argued that that would have suited, that utility would have played a role in setting the price for commodities, for, pro, for um, objects being traded between, on the borders between ancient tribes because one tribe wouldn't know how the other tribe made whatever they were making, and therefore there'd be some way in which the utility of the object, which this tribe could not make, would be part of what they'd be willing to pay for the price of it. So you know the classic story about um, Manhattan being sold for 30 glass beads. Okay. Now glass beads were apparently a trading object, so it isn't entirely strange to sell them for, for, gla for glass beads, but the, you have a civilization which can't make something trading with another civilization that can and Marx said, in that situation, he's quite willing to admit that utility would play some role in the price you'd set. But he said, after a while, the, when you have this, this regular trade between these two communities, ultimately they, they don't necessarily learn the technology, but they get an idea of the amount of effort involved in making whatever's being made by the other tribe. And secondly, the, both tribes start to make some of this stuff not for their own consumption now, but specifically for trading. So rather than the, the, project having, the product having utility for the seller, it has no utility for the seller, but all utility for the buyer. And therefore, um, the whole idea in marginal, marginal utility theory is that each object sold by the seller has a diminishing marginal utility for them as well. Okay? They're, they're giving away something they could otherwise consume. Much of that's nonsense in capitalist production, even in you know, pre-capitalist societies I mean, after the early tribal contacts. The stuff is being made specifically for sale. There's no utility for the seller in that point. And therefore, there's a gap between use value and exchange value. And I thought that's a really intriguing analysis. And um, when I looked at it, Mark said, well, the, the worker sells himself or herself and gets their exchange value back, which is their cost of production, which is assistance wage. The buyer, who's the capitalist, gets their use value, which is the capacity to produce goods for output, because they're unrelated to each other in Marx's theory of value, there'll be a gap, 
therefore there's a surplus, therefore labour is a source of surplus, which I thought was an eminently sensible way to argue that labour is a source of surplus. But to me, exactly the same argument applied to machinery. You pay them for the machine its cost of production, which is exchange value. Its use value is it can produce goods for output. Gap between the two, there'll be a surplus. My fellow students laughed at me over that one. Uh, one of them said I'd been critically exposed, and I said, bullshit, you just laughed, you didn't listen. So I finally wrote my master's on that subject. But there's, right at the very beginning, there's something in my interests about theories of value, and in a strange way, the role of energy. So I'm, going to fa I'm just going to fast forward now to the energy issue, because, of course, economic theory, the neoclassical theory, has got the Cobb-Douglas production function and CES production functions, where you produce output using labour and capital, and some disembodied term for technology. We're all used to that. But the labour theory of value, it all comes from labour. You have a post-Keynesian theory, you've got the Leontief production technology, some constant relationship between capital and output, or you know, variable capacity utilisation, some constant relationship between capital and labour. And that's it. There's no role for energy. Okay. And now, have you read any work by Georges Rosen? Okay, some of you have. So Rosen was the first person to try to bring energy in in a systematic way. And what he proposed was he took the Cobb-Douglas production function and he added energy as an additional term. So he had output Y was equal to uh, L to, to, the, uh, to the alpha times K to the beta times E to the 1 minus alpha minus beta. And really, we hadn't gone much past that. The, the main person who's worked in sort of trying to bring together theories of energy is Bob Ayres. Have you read any work by Bob Ayres? Okay, another name to take a look at, A-Y-R-E-S. And Bob Ayres working with a guy called Kumel, K-U-M-M-E-L, as a couple of the leading modern researchers into bringing energy into theory of production. And what they've done is, first of all, start with much the same idea that Rosen did, but they've then done a set of transformations to produce what they call the Linux, linear exponential production model, which fundamentally has, I think it's output being linear in capital and exponential in labour or something of that nature. And I still wasn't happy with that because if you set the coefficients of alpha and beta suitably, you could have the exponent for energy being zero and you could still talk about output, which didn't make sense. You know. And this comes back to the laws of thermodynamics. Nothing can be done with it. nothing can be done at all without energy. Life doesn't exist without energy. So energy plays a fundamental role. It can't be something you can eliminate. Anyway, I'm, Bob and I have become good friends and we co-researchers and I was staying in his house in Paris and he happens to have a house full of statues, absolutely full of them. It's, it's, like, an, it's like an art gallery. It's like you've got a combination of a library. Every room's got about five bookshelves, 10, 20 bookshelves. It's crazy. Paintings everywhere, sculptures everywhere. And I'm walking back one night uh, to, to my bedroom and still thinking about this issue because that's what we're working on. And a little insight came to me. Capital without energy is a sculpture. Labour without energy is a corpse. And I thought, so hang on a sec, that means that rather than adding energy as the third input, what labour and capital are a means to harness the free energy we find in the universe and convert it to doing useful work. So rather than y equals L times E times K raised to various powers, it's Y, which is a function of energy, is equal to K, which is, a, is a, with, a, with energy as its argument, times L, as its energy as its argument. And I sat down and worked out the mathematics of that and about five minutes later, I had the formula I'll show you in a moment. And my first reaction was, is that all? It was so simple. And when you look at it, it's so bloody obvious. But nobody had done it before. So that's what I've done now. So what I now want to do is say, given that foundation, where does economics start? And I argue that the real father of that economics is not Adam Smith, but Richard Cantillon. Has anybody read Richard Cantillon? I recommend reading some Cantillon, okay? Uh, Essays on the Nature of Economics, I think is the, the translation. He's Irish, and he was working in France in the 1700s, and wrote this, I think, in about 1713 or there, thereabouts. Uh, but I think Smith actually led us astray, because Smith was went to meet the physiocrats, not Cantillon. I think Cantillon was dead by the time Smith went to France. But he certainly met Canet, and he engaged with the physiocrats, and that was a large part of where Smith's own interest in economics came from. But I, what he did was he, he dropped out the major innovation the physiocrats had, and then economics progressed 
from the point where Smith had left out the most important thing that the physicists had contributed. And I think that's where the whole labor theory of value and value wars came from, was actually Smith leaving out the most important part of the physiocrats. So rather than being the father of economics, I'm going to argue when I finally write my principles of political economy, that Smith was the one who led economics astray. So I want to now give you a bit of a reason why that is, because if you take a look at the, the opening line of the, of the um, wealth of nations, there's the annual labour, and of course I've bolded it, of every nation is the fund which originally supplies it with all the necessi necessaries and conveniences of life, and which is uh, either the produce of that labour or purchasing that from other nations. So bang, labour, you know, let's see if this works. Bang, that's the magic point there. Um, and that gets to value wars because if then Marx turns out into saying labour is the only source of surplus, there are plenty of pre-Marx labour theory of value advocates who argued, well, if labour is the source of surplus, why doesn't it get the whole of output? Okay. That was a political position before Marx came along and, and systematised it. And one thing I want you to be conscious of when you read people like Marx, you know one reason Marx moved from one place in London to another? He and Jenny moved at one stage. Yes, Any other one? Money, Pardon? Political Pardon? Lack of money, political um, people after him because he was writing the manifesto. No, no. A cholera outbreak. Oh, that killed his kids. But, but see, this is what we tend to... We, 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 we think about England these days. We think about London, you know, as we know it. London was like Calcutta. If you want to get an idea of what London was like when Marx was writing Das Kapital, think Calcutta, okay? And think Calcutta 30 years ago too. That's how bad the situation was. You literally would move somewhere because there was a cholera outbreak. So the, the level of, of, uh, of, a possession, of, of oppression and pollution and the precariousness of life, half, most of his kids died, you know? He, he had to think about, about, I've forgotten how many kids he had, but about five of the seven died, okay? It's the sort of world, really, the only way you can relate to it is to, is to put yourself in um, something like India in the 1970s to get a feeling for how it might be. If you, if you read A Suitable Boy, you've read the novel A Suitable Boy? Okay, have a look at that and to get a feeling of what life can be like if you're working in the tanning pits. Um, not that the, the protagonist did, but they went through a tan, tanning pit. But that, that's, that's how appalling the situation was. So to have a, a working class revolt is not amazing. And Marx really harnessed that with the labour theory of value. And of course, the neoclassicals' response to that was political, because until um, Marx came along, the dominant theory of economics was the classical school that saw labour as the source of value. Whatever that might mean to, to Smith and Ricardo, that was their, their foundation. Labour was the, the source, and this is where, Mark, where Smith leads us astray. Then, of course, when Marx makes into a point of revolution, that's when neoclassical economics evolves. You had precursors of the neoclassicals. Have anybody read, you've read uh, some Jean-Baptiste to say? Yes. Okay. Have you read any Corner? Okay. Corner was writing in the 18, 1810s, 1820s. So you had the marginal uh, productivity uh, theory of production turning up in Corner with the idea of the competition of the two spas. So there's a long history of it, but they were the living in the undergrowth of economics. Now, in the 1870s, they become dominant. What do they argue? That both labour and capital are necessary. And you finally get, um, in the late, 1900, late, late 1800s, um, J.B. Clark comes along and argues that there's the uh, factors of production receive their marginal product, okay? which is a meritocratic theory of distribution, as well as a meritocratic theory of production. You put in, You get out what you put in. Your marginal product is what you provide. Your marginal product is what you get paid. So in that sense, there's no sense of exploitation. Um, and they're seeing them, these two factors of production jointly producing output and, and splitting the proceeds on the basis on which they make a contribution to output. Now, there's no role for energy in that. So you've got this, the classic Cobb-Douglas production function. Um, now, energy is not even there. And that applies to the Marxists as well, of course, because with labour theory of value, what you're told is surplus is proportional to labour input. All sorts of technical issues in that, of course, which has been the main focus of criticism, uh, but that's got no labour in it. Neoclassicals, you have substitutable factors of production that produce output, and post-Keynesians, you have output in a fixed proportion. So there's 
either the capital output ratio or, or labor productivity uh, function gives you the level of output. And then Kuhn and came along and they said, well, here's this idea of a substitutable function. You then take logs of the whole thing and you get a new equation. But there's no, no role for labor there. There's no role for, no role for energy there. No role for energy in any of those. And there's a role down here, but if you set the, the, as I said, the exponents properly, you can get rid of energy. Okay. So my little insight, which I said well, I only got last year while I was actually in, in Bob Air's uh, place, was to get past that, that issue by understanding, to some extent, the laws of thermodynamics. Have you read any thermodynamics? Okay. That's one you have to, It's hard to get your head around. It's very, very... I always get entropy wrong. I use the wrong, I say it's high when it's low and vice versa. But the fundamental idea is you can't produce anything without energy. Now, if you look back and see which school of thought actually had some awareness of that, the physiocrats were the only ones. Because here's the opening line of Cantillon's book. Now, I've got 1755 as a publication date. Gonzalo Fonseca uh, pointed out I got my dates wrong. That was a republication date. It was actually published in about 1715. I've got to fix that up. But this is his opening line. Land is the source or matter from which all wealth is drawn. Man's labour finds provides the form of its production, and wealth is not but the food, conveniences, and pleasures of life. Now, how similar is Smith's sentence to that? Okay. He's got the same, even the same, you know, what's the term, cant or metric to it, uh, but he's substituted land, labour with land, or land with labour. That's a mistake. Labour, in that sense, makes much more sense than, la than labour, because land receives energy. Okay? You're looking back in a rural society, agricultural society at the time, land is the main means by which humanity harnessed energy before we had the um, building of the manufacturing sector using, of course, stored solar power, which they didn't know it was stored solar power at the time. That's what it was. So what you then have is labour and capital harness the energy we find landing on the planet because it happens to orbit a thing called the sun. And nobody built the sun, so far as we're aware. Okay, so therefore we're using free energy in that sense. What labour and capital do is take that free energy and make it into useful work. So it shouldn't be y equals a times k to the alpha times l to the minus alpha, but seeing them overall output as a function of energy, and labour and capital are the means to harness that energy. So what I now ended up doing is saying we should redefine energy, or redefine GDP as useful work. Okay, in terms of what real GDP is, real GDP is useful work. Yeah. Oh, okay, just waving away. Okay. Okay. So this is the little insight that this this is what gave me the idea, quite literally, just having this thought walking through Bob Ayers' house on the way back from the bathroom to the bedroom, and walking past all these sculptures. That's what gave me that idea. Labour that energy is a corpse. Yeah. Capital that energy is a sculpture. Okay. So the whole idea of labour and capital, that energy, doesn't make sense. But we've been doing that for going on a quarter of a millennium now. So think of them as ways to harness that free energy and think of GDP as useful work. So you start from that expression. I'm going to put it first in neoclassical form and then in post-Keynesian form. So what I'm now doing is measuring everything in megajoules, or megawatts I should use. A joule is a unit of energy, a watt is in it energy per unit of time. So I've got to revise some of this stuff as time goes on. Apparently, do you have any much, how, much, how much energy you are all uh, consuming right now? Any idea in terms of watts? This is a nice little uh, factoid that I'm going to build a few arguments on later. Calories? Pardon? Calories? Uh, calories, you know, it's about 2,000, 3,000 calories a day. Mm -hmm. When you convert that to watts, like, you know, how, how, you know, how much uh, electric power is there in a light bulb? an old incandescent light bulb. 110. Pardon? 110. 110, 120. You guys are consuming about 90. Okay? That's your energy to stay, simply sit there and breathe. Okay. The entire day. 90, 90, 90 per, it's, it's per, per second. Like, oh, per watts second. is a measure of energy of joules per second. So you're using 90 watts just to sit there. If you're doing work, you might be using 200 watts. So in that sense, the amount of energy that can be exploited out of you is that gap between the amount of energy needed for you to continue surviving, and 90 is your, roughly your basal, basal rate, the base rate you need just to stay alive. So the gap between the energy, the energy can be harnessed if you're used to do useful work, is about, say, 
200, maybe 200 watts, and therefore you need about 100 watts, maybe 120 to survive. Okay? And that's the source of surplus and that sense of energy from labour. But the actual work depends upon how many workers you're talking about, how many machines you have, and I've got Kane inverted commas for the very obvious reason of the capital controversies, how you define adding up machines, but an individual machine, you can literally say what that machine uses, uses an energy throughput. So this is also an advantage when you think about the capital controversies and the definition of, of labour, of, of, of machinery, and, and how do you add it up. One way to add it up much more effectively than the dated labour forms that Straffa used is going to be the amount of energy harnessed by the machine. So this is this, this actually has completely transformed my way of thinking about economics. And I've still got a long way to go before I've got it all worked out. But the amount of work actually done. So you're talking about energy as an input, and of course energy on its own is not something you can you can enjoy. You can you can enjoy sunlight, okay? Obviously we all do that. But if I use the energy involved in a Falcon 9 rocket inside this room, we'd be the building would be blown to smithereens. Okay. What you want to do is take that energy and do useful work. So to do useful work, some of the energy has to be wasted. And that's part of what I'm going to go on to in a moment. So you have the number of units of labour and capital. <coughs> the flow of energy per unit of time. That's why watts are a more sensible measure than joules. Because the watt is a minute. Is, apparently one watt is one joule per second. Okay, and one joule is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of, I think, one cubic centimetre of water by one degree. Again, I'm an amateur on physics. So um, I learned physics at school, but not since. But those are the sort of measures I think we now start to need to use to actually get a sensible definition of real output. But that's the flow of energy per unit of time harnessed by labour and capital. Then there's a ratio available for useful work, and this comes down to the laws of thermodynamics. But again, in your case, if, if you actually, in an overall, overall day, if you actually uh, consumed an amount of energy uh, or embodied an amount of energy equivalent to 200 watts, if I tried to exploit the two whole 200 watts, you'd be die over time because I'd be working you to the bone. Okay, so the certain amount of energy that you consume has to be there for your own reproduction, and therefore that part in that sense can't be made for useful work in terms of the person who's employing you. So there's a gap between useful work and actual energy input in the first place, and there's the laws of thermodynamics give us an idea of what that is. And then finally, how efficiently are you doing that work? This is something I've debated with Bob, because I'm now involved, Bob, in working on a joint paper which I hope will be coming out in the Journal of Ecological Economics sometime next year. But that's the basic set of arguments. So you put them together, what I've got there, I hope this highlight works okay. So I've got, there's the number of machines, there's the energy per machine. Now, of course, the number of machines can change over time and does. The energy that a machine can consume has gone up dramatically over time. What I've got here is the ratio of the actual the energy to the amount that can actually be used for useful work. Okay. Multiplied by how efficiently that is done, and exactly the same expression for labour in that sense. So that's that's the set of concepts. Now you can see a few cancellations are possible there. I can cancel out the energy and just be left with what's called exergy, the useful work the machine can do, and ditto for labour. Uh, and I can also, as you see in a moment, I can multiply the Number of the mach number of machines by the energy per machine. We don't know either of those. We know them for individual machines, and we, we can't produce a collective production function at that level. We can multiply those two terms together and say, what's the energy used by industry in general? And we do have data for that. So it's something which actually brings us closer to the data right from the outset. So if I now multiply those through, I've now got little x, x subscript k and x subscript l of the exergy energy ratio for, for, labor and, for machines and labor, respectively. And then EL is the efficiency. The idea of the efficiency term is that if you imagine to want to define perfect efficiency, to me the perfect efficiency like in transportation is what amount of energy would it take to move a mass, say, of 100 kilos, to move that mass one kilometre in one minute. Okay, and it's In a totally frictionless environment, you need a force to start it moving and a force to stop it at the other end. You could add it up and say that would be perfect efficiency. Now, how does a car compare to that? Okay. How does a car in a traffic jam compare to that? How does Elon Musk's idea of the, what do you call it, the uh, hyper hyperloop compare to that? 
etc etc so I think it makes sense to have that as a separate term and I'll, I'll show you the, the use of that shortly so we put that in the terms that the neoclassicals use you now have cat, all those terms multiplied to the to the exponents alpha and 1 minus alpha so let's work it out and rearrange it you rearrange that term and what do you get well you've got uh, the you've got partly the Cobb Douglas production function capital to the alpha labor to the 1 minus alpha okay. you no longer have the a term now, have you seen have you seen the details on the dimensionality of the A term and the Cobb Douglas production function? Okay, it's got the craziest dimensionality, and this is another thing that I want to bring into economics to understand dimensionality. Because we if you look at that the actual original Cobb Douglas production function, it has Y, which is measured in terms of a a uh, inflation discounted measure of, of nominal output. Okay, this is a dollars constant uh, constant value dollars on one side, labour measured in terms of hours hours of, of uh, hours of work per person, times how many people there are, and capital. How the hell do we measure capital? Okay, so all these aggregation problems apply there. When you look at it to make a to, to, to you, what has to happen for dimensionality for any valid equation is the dimensionality of both sides has to be consistent. Okay. Now, if you look at the dimensionality of GDP, it's uh, like Lepre's index deflated nominal GDP. So it's dollars, constant term dollars per year, dollars divided by time. On the other side, you've got labour, hours of labour divided by time. Machinery, what the hell is that? So what A ends up being is the term that cancels all the stuff to make the dimensionality the same, and it's a total mess. It makes no sense whatsoever. That's the term. When, when, when neoclassicals tried to fit their equation to data, 85% of the change came in the A term. Now, that's the solar residual. Yeah. What the solar residual actually is, in a genuine sense, is the contribution of machinery's energy harnessed by machinery. So, okay. Professor, wouldn't we have the same problem? It seems to me I understand um, one of the main difficulties to measure capital. Yeah. I mean, it has has always been the problem, and then you have the capital controversy yeah. and so on. But it seems to me, when you look in from the perspective of energy, we are adding a a, 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 diff, a new issue in terms of how we're going to end up measuring that. If it's not going to be through hours, it'll be through kilojoules, kilowatts, but it's still or megawatts. But it's still you're going to have to know how much kilowatt will be spent in a certain amount of time to produce something. Yep. As far as theory of value goes, yep. right? So. And how then it comes my kind of second question: If it's still going to be based on time, how are we going to remunerate that in the same? How, how do you rem, remunerate? Like remunerate? Yeah. Well, you're going, your production system is different to your distribution system. So this is what the neoclassicals they, they did it unconsciously, to some extent consciously, as a way of fighting the labor theory of value. But they made remuneration, the theory of remuneration, precisely the same as the theory of production. That's wrong. The theory of production has got nothing to do with the theory of remuneration, okay. and that was Marx's advantage in that sense, and the and the and the, um, the physiocrats as well. The theory of production was one thing; the remuneration went to the owners. So the the physiocrats divided the world into the productive class, which were basically agricultural workers, okay, the unproductive class, which were manufacturing workers, and the the ster they actually called them the sterile class. Yeah. They couldn't see any way in which manufacturing labor produced value but of course if you're thinking in agriculture and this is actually stated by Cantillon and most of the others mm -hmm. at some point you plant one seed you get 50 seeds back okay so one of the advantages of being an agricultural society when they wrote compared to when Smith wrote you know, some 60 70 years after Cantillon in an industrializing part of the world the visibility of that physical surplus wasn't as obvious to Smith as it was to Cantillon so they thought you plant one seed, you get 50 back. It's the free gift of nature. Okay. Now, so in that sense, the production has got nothing to do with remuneration. We generate a surplus by exploiting free energy. We then fight over the spoils. Well, I, I totally agree with that. But you know, within capitalism, the entire point of production mm -hmm. is to produce something to then have the remuneration and yep. distribution. So, yes, yeah, I see that there are two different moments, but they are connected. Yeah. So we're still going to look at, at that approach and have a problem of how we're yep. going to pay yep, for exactly, that energy. Exactly, right. yeah. and that comes down to why do workers get a wage in the first place? 
Now, in my the labour theory of value says you've got to pay a workers' wages because they're the source of surplus. So if you don't hire them, you can't get them to do work, and that's why you don't you've got to pay them a wage. The neoclassicals say workers get produce a marginal product, and you pay them for marginal products. I'm saying bullshit to both of those arguments. The basic point is. You've got machines that are doing the vast majority of turning free energy into useful work. If you're going to get the machines operated, you need workers to operate them. Effectively, workers can blackmail the capitalists to pay them to operate the machines. And how much need there is for workers to do that is a major part of what sets the wage. It's a political struggle. Yeah. It has to be a political struggle. Yeah. Sure, if we go with your logic, then in a society in which now, like robotic or other technologies, gain growth, etc. So, uh, th what would happen to this kind of processes? Because and, th and then there will be no political struggle over there, as you yep. described, because labor will not be needed. Exactly. And then, so we um, end up we end up in the I Hunger Games. that direction because I feel that there is something over there. Yeah, I think that's that's. That, that's one major reason I, like most post Keynesians, support job guarantee and they're against the idea of a universal basic income. Okay. My position pretty much is we need universal basic income because workers have no bargaining power whatsoever through labour anymore. Okay. The only bargaining power they're really going to have is through the political process. With the political process, you can say, okay, the society is generating this amount of, of surplus energy, and energy of, 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 of useful work via energy. And we want to make sure that the population in general enjoys enough of that, not to, you know, to have a, have a decent life and not starve. And to do that, you're going to have, to have universal basic income because ultimately, the way technology is moving, labour is going to be unnecessary for the vast majority of jobs. There's going to be a trivial number of jobs that are going to require labour directly, and they're going to be specifically things where you want a human doing something to you rather than a machine. Okay, and they're going to be something where you. Uh, where, where you have to innovate and come up with new ideas, or there's a form of maintenance which is just too complicated for a machine to do. But is it, one of the remarkable things I saw recently, I'll see if I can find it on on uh, on the web here. Uh, I w when I first saw this as a tweet about two or three weeks, actually just a week ago, I think, I thought this has got to be a joke. So just give me a second to see if I can find it. Uh, Let's see. This is genuinely real, guys. I was, I still, I mean, I, I knew this sort of thing was going to happen, but I thought, not now, you've got to be kidding. There's got to be, there's got to be some sort of human behind this. I'm trying to get to see that. Well, actually, okay, that's not a movie of it. Let's see if I can find the movie of it. Advertising, where is it? Okay, this one might be robotics. Let's check that one out. Okay, now I am not joking. This is real. Totally robotic arm. This is what they did. They watched the, the, the way that they filmed the, the virtual reality filming of a top class chef. They saw the arm movements involved, including the flourishes, including the flourishes in, in making food, and they then put that into the program of the computer. And it will now look this stretch. You want to buy one? They're on sale. So people think, oh, we can do other stuff, like we can do chefs. Yeah, sure. Every house that can afford it is going to have one of those in the not-too-distant future. And by the not-too-distant future, I mean like the next five years. Okay. So How, how is that different from buying food from, you know, or ready-made food or frozen food? Well, people say, look, uh, the, we, we, yeah, we're going to buy ready-made food, but uh, we'll, we'll take it back home and we'll prepare it. We're all the, who watches food classes on TV? I don't. Okay, <laughs> but there, you know, this, what, what we, we get, we get Big Brother, and we get, um, uh, you know, Master Chef, all this sort of stuff. Master Chef isn't going to survive this technology. So the idea. My, my point is. Yeah. 
how is that disrupting the actual state of the world? Because people still have a choice between cooking or buying food that is made by machines like the, the frozen. Yeah, well, in their case, in both cases, they've got to choose the choice of having the machine in the house or having the machine in the factory. Yeah, exactly. So but there's no labor. There's no labor involved in producing the food. But, but that would not change with those machines. The choice, but, already, the choice is already there. This this, but the people, are, are, people are saying to me, well, there'll be other jobs, we'll find other stuff for people. They're saying I'm being a Luddite by saying labour can be replaced in all areas. I'm saying, no, it can be replaced in literally all areas. Like, including that could give you a, a genuine Thai massage. Mm -hmm. Okay? You might prefer a human for the job, but it would give you a genuine <laughs> Thai massage. Okay? So that the, there is virtually nothing that labour currently does that can't be automated except designing the machines in the first place, yeah. okay? So the amount of genuine labour that's going to necessarily reduction in the future is going to plunge drastically. Already, 90% of the jobs we do don't, don't produce anything. And this is uh, uh, David Graeber. You know David Graeber? Yes. Have you read Debt the First 5,000 yes. Years? That's going to be trivial compared to his next book, yeah. which is coming out in April called Bullshit Jobs, okay? Is it not 3,000 words, David? Pardon? Is it not a brick? It'll be a brick. Oh. Yeah, oh, not quite as big a brick as debt. Okay. But uh, that, that's going to make a fortune for David, which I'm delighted by. Uh, but he says most people, some people do jobs they know are actually negative. That's what he's looking for. Bullshit job is a job you do that produces nothing that you know produces nothing and you hate it. Okay? Mm -hmm. What we're doing, he calls leisure. Okay. We're here because we're intellectually stimulated. A lot, yeah. Sorry. I haven't been... So as you said, the book is not out yet, but from the interviews it seems to me that these bullshit jobs, according to his theory or his argument, is the result of bureaucracy rather than the result of technology. Well, the bureaucracy itself, I mean... The size of large firms that yeah. like have these... Yeah, but the bureaucracy people. itself can be automated and, you know, frankly do a better job than the human bureaucracy as well. Mm -hmm. We're all starting to see that in terms of forms on the internet and stuff of that nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, like, if, if you think about what we've just been through to get inside the UN compound here, I mean, at some point in the future, you'll walk up to a machine, it'll check your eyeballs, make sure your eyeballs are the same as what's shown on the passport, whatever that might be. Um, you know, the badge will be printed for you, it'll be, it'll, it'll be placed on the lapel by a machine like that, and you'll walk inside here. So, the, that, in that sense, the bargaining power of labour is going to zero. And therefore, I think to have a, have a human society, we have two choices. Either we get the Hunger Games, where a tiny elite enjoys the energy, <coughs> output of energy, and the rest of us get entertained killing each other. Or we universal basic income, and in that sense, it's a sort of trans-capitalist world. You can still have capitalists making a larger share of production by far than getting a universal basic income that has to be there. But unless we do something like that, we're trapped. And again, not realising the role of energy, I think there's a major part where we've got us to this point without even bloody well thinking about it. So it's um, yeah. five minutes past nine now. Okay, well, I'm okay with... Um, when, when I think Daniel was suggesting, but I, I, I'm not sure yeah. when you have to leave for your... Uh, I think I'm okay. I can go to about half past nine. I've got to see... Yeah, we also have some other stuff. I don't know about... Yeah, the okay. Well, I'll finish, I'll finish the stuff on energy, and then I'll cover one more thing. So that's... Yeah, so when yeah. you round... Like, try to round it up in, like, ten minutes or okay, so. Okay, okay. So that's, that's the energy contribution of, la of labour. Now, if you think about it... Um, I was using calories a day, then I'm going to change that over to watts. That might be 200 watts. Um, let's say the, of that, 100 watts is available to get work done. And let's say your efficiency of that is 50%. Well, you're looking about, you know, 250 watts is all you can put in at any point in time. Um, and I just use a constant of 1,000 for that and just call it uh, the Greek letter for capital L. Uh, and that's, as I change the exponents, it's going to you know, have different values to it. Now, for machinery, <coughs> what you've got is the energy that a machine consumes per unit of time. And that's increased incredibly. I got, got the figures wrong in the last time I gave something like this presentation. But the amount of energy consumed by a James Watt steam engine was of the order of a 1,000 or so watts. Okay. The amount of energy consumed by the Falcon 9 rocket is the order of tens, hundreds and thousands, millions of watts. Okay? So that's been the major source of the increase in wealth we have, the amount of energy we can harness using machinery, fundamentally. And then you look at how efficiently it's been used, and of course those are time varying. When energy seems to be incredibly uh, available and cheap, we don't particularly worry about the efficiency with which we use it. 
when its price goes up radically, we start to worry about that. And you'll see that in the next couple of slides. So the final formula ends up being this expression. Um, and compared to the Cobb-Douglas production function, what you've got is that this A term over here, that's been replaced by this. So, and that's because nonsense dimensionality, this is in megajoules or megawatts. So it makes more sensible. So the energy component, the energy harnessed by machinery is fundamentally what was, that's the reason the solar residual was so big, even though it made no dimensional sense. It had to be big because that was the contribution of, uh, of energy from machines to output. Now, if you look at the Kumalaire's form, um, if you try to try to reduce the Kumalaire's form to GDP per capita, you can't do it because, as you'll see, you, you get nonsense terms for capital and labour. But if I put my expression in output per, per labour term, per unit of labour, I get an expression like the neoclassicals used for, for capital intensity. But I can also put it in terms of um, of um, of output per head, and I'll show you that in a moment. So rather than K, which we know is a nonsense term, and energy per machine, which we'd have to go and find out what the hell that is for each machine, we do actually know the amount of energy consumed by, by industry over time. There's good, reasonably good data in America in particular, and pretty good data for 17 European Union countries, which I'm working on with a, a couple of others right now to try to build a a mathematical model of that. So I'm going to say e, e, that's a Greek E. It doesn't look all that obvious, unfortunately. It's very similar. But that's the Greek E. That's energy uh, used in manufacturing, which we do know, which are equal to two terms we don't know that are in that expression. So I'm going to substitute that into the expression. So I got output is some constant Greek lamp, uh, L multiplied by labor to the 1 minus alpha times the energy used by machine in machinery to the alpha times the efficiency with which that's done. And I can then put it into per capita terms. And what I now get, because I'm, I'm now dividing n, n, I'm dividing L by N and K by N, each raised to exponents, out of one I get the employment rate, which is lambda, and the other I get the energy per capita. Sorry, lambda, lambda is the... Lambda is, is the yeah. labour divided by population. Oh, okay. It's uh, the employment rate. Steph, yeah. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but uh, um, I literally just spoke with Stephanie and she was, she was waiting for uh, for you. Oh. Uh, so... So I should leave now? Oh. Yeah, basically. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, ra I'll rapidly bust this, bust through this, but if, I, if you look at the data, what I've done here is I'd look at GDP per capita, the employment ratio, that's the capital stock data, which goes into Cobb-Douglas production, that's the actual energy per head. And much to my amazement, that peaked back in 1979. Okay, that's back at the time of the second oil crisis. Yeah. So trying to fit the two together, even though I thought it was, wasn't going to work, I get a higher correlation for my expression than I get for the Cobb-Douglas production function. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, the correlation point 0.73 there, the correlation point 0.81 when I use energy. Okay. And of course, there's a lot more work to be done. That's the opening of it, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have